Throughout the bloody battle for the Pacific, one class of fighting ship was always in the thick of the action. Its creed was to go in harm's way, and its motto, kill or be killed. From protecting the capital ships and bombarding enemy troops, to sinking submarines and bringing down the dreaded kamikaze, it took on the full ferocity of the Japanese and won. Always fighting at close range, they were the eyes, ears, and teeth of the American Navy, the destroyer. Best damn ship in the Navy. Thank God for the Fletchers, because I think the Fletchers were vital in winning the war. Using extraordinary archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations takes you into battle with a machine whose name says it all, the Destroyer. April the 9th, 1942, Japanese troops capture the Philippine Peninsula of Bataan. More than 70,000 Filipino and American troops are taken into captivity. It is the largest US Army in history to surrender and one of the blackest days of the war. Army commander General MacArthur vowed that one day he would return to retake the islands. But that day seemed a long way away. With the loss of Bataan, Japan appeared unbeatable. Poised to sweep across the whole of the Pacific, a shudder of fear reverberates throughout the free world. But on that very day, a ship with a radical new design was undergoing trials for the US Navy. It was the first of what would become one of the most successful fighting ships of World War II. The new Fletcher-class destroyers. The destroyer had its genesis as far back as the 1870s, when motor torpedo boats were used as a means of attacking battleships. Relatively small but extremely fast, they were usually armed with a single torpedo tube and some form of rapid-fire machine gun. By the outbreak of World War I, the torpedo boat had evolved into the destroyer and had become the backbone of navies throughout the world. But in the 1920s, cautious eyes were beginning to be turned east when the first of Japan's new class of destroyers was launched. These fast, heavily armed ships with five-inch guns were more than a match for anything that the West had. As Japan's expansionist policies increased, so did her fleet. Soon, mighty battleships, carriers, and cruisers were all coming off the slipways. Germany and Italy were also hell-bent on building up their fleets as ship after ship took to the seas. But in America, very little was done to counter these threats. The design of the American destroyer uh, really just was static into the 20s and early 30s. Uh, no new ships were built, uh, many were decommissioned. So basically, the type of destroyer that the Navy, U.S. Navy had into the 20s and 30s was the World War I emergency program flush deckers. As the world entered a crazy race to rearm, American naval designers finally took a hard look at these new battle fleets. What they saw was alarming. The message was clear. As a counter to these new ships, they had to come up with a fast and heavily armed destroyer of their own. The designers also faced an added problem aircraft. As planes became faster and more powerful, a new breed of destroyer would have to be able to carry enough firepower to protect themselves and to destroy the aircraft. Slowly, a new design evolved, and in 1939, plans were laid down to build a new class of American destroyer, the Fletcher class. These would be the largest class of destroyer ever built by any nation. Its design was an engineering achievement of balancing ruggedness and seaworthiness, armament and speed on a classically proportioned steel hull. At 376 feet long and nearly 2,900 tons when fully loaded, the Fletchers were significantly larger than any previous American destroyer. They had five five-inch guns, 10 21-inch torpedo tubes, seven 40 millimeter and seven 20 millimeter guns. They were also armed with 56 depth charges. 
The destroyer would also be the first to be fitted with surface and air warning radar. With their 60,000 shaft horsepower engines delivering a speed of over 36 knots, the destroyer was destined to be an awesome fighting machine. And world events would soon prove it. In September 1939, Germany invaded Poland and World War II began. By 1940, the war at sea had intensified and German U-boats began decimating British convoys in the Atlantic. While still neutral, one incident would bring America one step closer to war. On September the 4th, 1941, during a routine convoy patrol, an American World War I destroyer, the Greer, had two torpedoes fired at her by a U-boat. The U-boat fired torpedoes at the Greer, which in turn uh, responded with depth charges. The Greer, of course, had been shadowing the submarine, and so the German uh, U-boat skipper, in defending his ship, you know, fired torpedoes. Although the Greer was not hit, in a fireside chat, President Roosevelt sent a chilling message to Germany. With millions of Americans listening in on the message, he issued a shoot-on-sight order to the US Navy on any German vessel found in American waters. But let this warning be clear. From now on, if German or Italian vessels of war enter the waters, the protection of which is necessary for American defense, they do so at their own peril. Shortly afterwards, another U.S. destroyer, the USS Kearney, was badly damaged by torpedo with the loss of 11 American sailors. These were the first U.S. deaths by Germans. America had been blooded in a war that it was not part of, and the U.S. Navy's destroyers had fired America's first shots of the war. Little did anyone know that this was just the beginning, and full-scale world war was soon to erupt, with the destroyer at the tip of the spear. On Sunday, the 7th of December, 1941, Japan held its aircraft at the American Pacific Fleet in Pearl Harbor. Within 55 minutes, the fleet lay in ruins. America was at war. Immediately, the might of US industry mobilized behind the war effort. Its Pacific fleet had been severely damaged and it needed ships to take the fight back to Japan. Along the length and breadth of America, shipyards sprang into action to build the hardware that would avenge Pearl Harbor. Eleven shipyards were given the task to build these new destroyers. As ship after ship started to roll off the production line, the call went out for seamen to man them. I was 17 years old, and I enlisted when, eight days after turning 17, and about three days later, I was sworn in and on my way to San Diego. I had been to Boy Scout camp, but it was a far cry from that because um, uh, it was, everything went by the book, it went by the bell, it went by the whistle, and, and the chief made us march up and down, and we had to go to bed at a certain time and get up at a certain time, take a shower every day, and shave, I'm 17 years old, shaving, I didn't have anything to shave. Straight from boot camp, these men, some as young as 16 years old, were sent to the U.S. Navy's most advanced destroyers. For many, it would be love at first sight. I I felt that I was going to be assigned to a, a small carrier, which I didn't want. And uh, then when I saw uh, a destroyer, I thought, well, now this is what I want. And as luck turned out, that's what I got. Well, I loved it immediately. That's called the Dungaree Navy. All one crew, really. Officers and men were one group together. Destroyer is a special thing unto itself. It, it has the speed and it throbs and you know you're at sea on those things. 
So it was something I found exhilarating. Meanwhile, the bloody fight for the Pacific intensified. Japan had conquered all before it. American forces had to take control of the sea before they could start to retake the islands, and the destroyer would be in the thick of the fighting. In June 1942 came Midway. In an unforgiving battle, the US Navy's aircraft sank four of Japan's frontline aircraft carriers. But it came at a price. The carrier USS Yorktown was also sunk. At the same hour, seven time zones to the east, the first of the new breed of destroyers was ready to enter the fight for the Pacific. But its crewmen would soon find out the conditions aboard a US destroyer were a far call from the comfort enjoyed by those sailors aboard the bigger capital ships. The complement of the ship was uh, slightly over 300 men, officers and, and, and crew. And uh, the officers, they lived two to a stateroom, and the uh, enlisted people lived 50, 60 in a, in a compartment. And the bunks were just big enough for one person. You didn't turn over too much because you'd fall out. They were stacked either three high or four high. I was on the bottom bunk, uh, so I was maybe this high off the, the deck, which meant I could get up easy, just roll out and, and start going. When everything you own goes in a little footlocker that big, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't seem like uh, you're needing space. You know, you got plenty of room. And as long as you got your bunk and, and uh, mattress, well, you're in pretty good shape. Heat was tremendous. Of course, you were constantly soaking wet in the tropics. And uh, on deck, it was always well into the hundreds. And you had to try to keep in the shade. If you were uh, away from the landmass and moving at a fairly good clip, it wasn't too bad because you had the air hitting you. But once you got into the channel there around Guadalcanal, the heat was just terrible there. Hotter than blue blazes. <laughs> and most of us went up on deck to sleep. And I can remember clearly being on the deck, and when the guy five-inch gun would go off, I'd come up off the deck and bounce down, and then go right back to sleep. <laughs> the food, um, you know, of course we had good food. Uh, you, it, you got a little bit tired of it. The old saying used to be that they had the best food in the world until the cooks got it, and then <laughs> they changed it all. But they did a good job, and. Uh, we ate real good, most of the time. The food was horrible. Uh, you know, it, it just, I think we had a bad cook, you know. And nobody ever gave three cheers for the cook on our ship, I'll tell you. They called out which watch was ready uh, for lunch or dinner or whatever. And of course, they just called it chow. And you got in line, went through with a metal tray, and they threw the food on the tray, and then you sat down and ate it, you know. I can't remember having but one or two good meals all the time I was on that ship. <laughs> For the officers, life on board a destroyer was much more comfortable. The officers lived pretty darn well. By tradition, they had Filipino mess boys in white jackets, a ward room with a ward room table and a couple of places to sit down. We were served on china and silver. <laughs> but it was the washroom facilities which were the harshest. Aft, where I lived, uh, we had <clears throat> two showers and, oh, maybe two dozen uh, uh, lavatories and, uh, and six toilets. And the toilets were, were a trough with planks across the trough to sit on and seawater running in one end and out the other. And of course, the ship rolled all the time and, and pitched, and it was always water on the deck, so your, your feet always got wet. When you went into a shower booth, there'd be four other guys already in there. <laughs> so you, what you did there was kind of lather up and uh, get splashed from these other fellows and then hopefully get 
uh, uh, enough water on you to get rid of the soap. So there's always maybe eight or ten naked men standing around either getting wet or soaping or getting rinsed or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was an experience. <laughs> but within the washroom, there was one place that no one wanted to be, on the red seat. Back then, during World War II and, and before, uh, if sailors who had a venereal disease, they uh, were considered to have stolen time from the Navy because they couldn't have certain duty, and they were set aside. And, and whatever time that they lost, they had to tack it on at the end of the enlistment so that they, the government didn't lose anything. And so rather than have them use the same facilities that everybody else had because might catch something, which, of course, you couldn't, but we didn't know that, they had a separate... Uh, toilet for that sort of thing. By the autumn of 1942, Fletcher-class destroyers had arrived in Guadalcanal and were formed into an elite fighting unit known as the Cactus Strike Force. For the US Navy, it wasn't a moment too soon. Japanese forces were continuing to advance. The technology, engineering, and armament of the destroyer had to pay off. Lives depended on it. By early 1943, the first five Fletcher-class destroyers had arrived in the Pacific, ready for action. Known as the Cactus Strike Force, their first role was to target and smash the Japanese supply convoys that were ferrying troops needed to continue their invasion of the Pacific Islands. It's something that's hard to describe. You have no lights. Not any ship has a light showing. And uh, there were all sorts of navigational hazards which you thought of. As a matter of fact, we were using some charts that dated back to the 1700s. We got very close within 60 miles of the Japanese airfield, so that's where we had to do it at night, and they were coming down mainly to resupply their troops, and they had a sophisticated marge system that would go hug the shoreline and go at night. So our job was to intercept them and uh, try to cut them off. And their job was to get bias. Already the role of the destroyer was changing. Once looked on as a defense for the capital ships, the new Fletchers were now being thrown into the furnace of battle. If there was a strong point you wanted reduced, you called for, uh, for fire from the ships offshore, and many times it was a destroyer that provided that. They would uh, screen the larger ships, the battleships, carriers, cruisers, uh, performing such duties as lifeguard. Uh, say if a pilot went down or a plane crashed the stern of the ship, the destroyer would be there to, to pick the pilot up, uh, usually rewarded by the carrier with a gallon of ice cream or two for their, uh, for their efforts. They performed convoy escort. Uh, in short, any duty that uh, needed a fast ship to go in harm's way, that uh, usually where the Fletchers ended up. The destroyer was a floating gun platform and the five five-inch guns with their devastating firepower were its main armament. The uh, five-inch 38 could fire a 54-pound projectile 18,000 yards, which is about nine nautical miles, about 10 and a half statue miles, had a ceiling of over 35,000 feet for uh, any aircraft. Then, of course, it could be used rapid fire uh, for beach invasions and that sort of thing. Ammunition from the magazines below decks was fed to the guns as fast as they could use them. We fired three every three seconds. But they had to qualify that because that if everything goes proper, these men laying these big projectiles in the tray, they can't hold up too long loading them that fast. I was three to four seconds was uh, pretty good for five or ten rounds. After that, your fire slows down. It's dirty. You'd be surprised that at, every time the gun fires, you have grease flying around and uh, gunpowder. And you come out, you, you're just peppered with grease all over your face and clothes, and very smoky, very noisy. 
the Fletcher's 40 and 20 mm anti-aircraft guns could put up a shield of steel against enemy bombers and fighters. The 40 mm rate of fire was 160 rounds per minute, and the 20 mm a staggering 450 per minute, enough to shred an aircraft in seconds. I was a loader on a 40 mm gun, which was a good position to be in. The problem was you were so busy loading that you couldn't, you couldn't really lo look at the plane that was coming in. And if you did, there was always a chance of you losing your concentration on getting that gun loaded. So I tried not to look at the planes coming in. Controlling all this firepower was a command center deep within the ship. Packed with the latest electronic radar, it could locate the enemy up to 40 miles away. It was known as the CIC. CIC is the Combat Information Center. And all communications and all the radar returns, all the radar equipment, and most of the radio equipment, too, was centered in the Combat Information Center. And all during any action of any sort, that's where everything was kept track of. With its radar tracking anything that moved above the surface, the Fletchers also had the most sophisticated sonar that enabled them to hunt down anything that was below the sea. As a sonarman, my assignment was to go up on the bridge where the sonar equipment was, and we sent out a signal underwater, uh, a sound signal, and it went out until it hit something, and we could tell by the time that the signal went out and the echo came back we would get the distance. And so we knew where it was. Then the officer says to the telephone talker, fire one. Fire one, fire one. Boom, boom, it goes out. Then fire two, fire three, fire four. And so they're going out on both sides of the ship, with three uh, uh, side racks of depth charges, and you have two stern racks, and two of them are going off at a time. The side racks are 300 pounds of TNT, and the stern is 600 pounds each. So you're putting a lot, of, a lot of explosives down there, and it doesn't have to land on deck. It just has to get close, because it'll open seams. And uh, once you open a seam in a submarine, there's not much else you can do but sink. And sink they did. The Fletcher-class destroyers sank 29 Japanese submarines. But just sinking a sub was not enough. You had to have proof of a kill. To determine the kill, well, we put a whaleboat over the side and sent a crew around to see what they could pick up and pick up a lot of flots. Some, sometimes we pick up uh, body parts. Uh, the second submarine we sank, uh, we found a piece of lung and the doctor aboard examined it and said the man had tuberculosis, almost an advanced stage. But because the destroyers were always in the thick of the action, fighting at a close range, their losses were beginning to mount. On the night of February the 1st, 1943, the USS De Haven was spotted by enemy aircraft off the coast of Guadalcanal. Fearing that they were an interception force sent to block their evacuation, the Japanese held a full squadron of dive bombers at the De Haven. I remember hearing, uh, knowing that there was conversation over the TBS, the talk between ships, that there were bogies in the area, and uh, they were suspected of being Japanese planes. But our captain, for some reason, decided to, to wait, to wait, to wait, to see if, if, if further identification of, the, of these planes could be made. And he waited, I guess, too long. And I stepped out on the starboard wing of the bridge and looked back aft, across the, the top of the stacks, and I saw the first bomber come in and I watched the bomb being released from beneath the plane. It was, that, it was that close, and I could see it. It's still a burnt orange color in my mind. It looked like the size of a, of a large ball. And I, at that instant, I said, I shouldn't be out here in the open. I, so I, I jumped inside very quickly into the sonar room. And a moment later, the explosion went off. I think the second bomb that hit knocked out the engine room. And of course, the third one would have to be the one that hit 
uh, the number two gun mount went down and set off the powder magazine down in the bottom of the ship to blow the bow off and just blasted the, the pilot house and the superstructure, pushed it back. I managed to pull myself loose. I just lowered myself about three feet into the water, swam away. I saw no, one, no other person until I was farther away from the ship. Then I realized there were other heads bobbing around in the water. And I looked back, perhaps a few minutes later, and watched the ship slide under the water. There were 167 men killed and 38 or 39 wounded. The De Haven was the first destroyer to be lost and the 15th American ship to be sunk in the bloody Guadalcanal campaign. But unknown to the men of the destroyers, it was just the beginning. Darker days were coming for the ships of the Pacific and their crews. By the spring of 1943, the Fletcher-class destroyer had established itself as a relentless multi-role attack machine against the Japanese. Constantly ready to go into action, each man's nerves were on edge for the dreaded call to general quarters. General quarters, general quarters, man your battle station. It was a little bit scary. You you know, you grabbed, you, usually you left your helmet up at the gun, at your battle station. You know, it was hooked onto the gun up there. So you just grabbed, if you were dressed, you went like you were. If you weren't dressed, you'd try to throw a pair of pants on and get up there as quick as you could. And you'd go up and man your station and then just wait from there to see what was going to happen next. With the call to general quarters and never knowing if they might be sunk, the men of the destroyers had a special way of protecting their valuables. The few little valuables we had, you know, we were always thinking what to do. We would put them in a rubber, we called them in those days, and today they call them condoms. But anyway, we would put all our little valuables in there and then tie a knot in this thing and keep it in our pocket. On every front, they were involved in close contact battle, using every one of their weapons to destroy the enemy. But perhaps one of the strangest weapons they used was on the night of April the 5th, 1943. The USS O'Bannon and the other destroyers of the Cactus Strike Force were returning from a mission bombarding Japanese shore positions when the O'Bannon picked up a large Japanese submarine on her sonar. Everybody looked and sure enough there was a submarine sitting on the surface. We had a Commodore aboard and he wanted to ram that submarine and uh, the captain didn't want to. Fearing that a collision could cause an explosion, the O'Bannon's captain ordered a hard change of course. As the two ships came within feet of each other, the Japanese suddenly woke up to the situation. We got right up to them, and they paid no attention to us, and we were running right alongside of them when they woke up and jumped up and started running around it. Nobody could fire anything. Our, our smallest guns could not come down to that to fire on the submarine either. So some of the fellows picked potatoes out of the bins, which were right handy, and started throwing them, because there they were, you know. And the Japanese evidently thought they were hand grenades, and so they ran and started throwing them back and throwing them off the submarine before they would blow up. And then in that period of time, they did not get to their gun, and we were able to pull away from them and start firing came back and made a run on them. And uh, evidently, we learned later that we actually did sink the submarine. A fitting tribute to the men of the O'Bannon was delivered in the form of a plaque. It was sent by the potato growers of Maine. The relentless fight for the Pacific continued through 1943, and by 1944, the destroyers had been involved in some of the bloodiest battles of World War II. But it was during the Battle of Leyte Gulf that the fighting men of the Tin Cans became legends. On October the 25th, four Fletcher-class destroyers were on escort duty, protecting a task force that was involved in landing operations at Leyte Gulf. Two of these destroyers were the USS Johnston and the USS Hull. When the Johnston had been commissioned, her captain, 
Commander Ernest Evans made a speech to his crew that typified the destroyer man's creed. This is going to be a fighting ship. I intend to go in harm's way, and anyone who doesn't want to go along had better get off right now. I said he, he had more courage than was good for the rest of us. Believing that they were screened from any surface attack by the ships of Admiral Halsey's 7th Fleet, the Johnston and Hull were completely surprised when heavy shells started to land around them. The two destroyers, the Johnston and the Hull, were in the gun sights of the Japanese Navy's center fleet. There were four battleships in that Japanese fleet, eight cruisers and 11 or more destroyers. And uh, the Yamato was the largest battleship in the world. They had 18.1 inch guns and they had nine of them. And uh, one projectile weighed about 3,400 pounds compared to our 54 pounds for a five inch projectile. Captain Evans, who had promised his men that they were going into harm's way, led his ship in a David and Goliath heroic attack. The first order I heard him give was all ahead flank, and uh, which meant as fast as you could go. We began making smoke, zigzagging. So he told our gunnery officer to pick out one of those lead cruisers, and we did. And we made the torpedo run on it, and I know I stood over on the, the starboard side and watched all 10 torpedoes as they were fired. We completed our run, and then we turned, and we was trying to retire into our own smoke, and then we was hit for the first time with the, the three 14-inch projectiles, mostly a midship. The ship just completely rose up out of the water and came down with a thud. That projectile, it's got a whoa, whoa like that, and it's a, a terrible noise. For some reason, I just turned and, and, and started walking forward, and I only got just a few feet. And as a round came in and killed most of those guys that I was standing with. And I look back and I, I recall, I can still see it today, one of my friends from about half up and his arms are still moving. Helpless in the water and pounded by the Japanese heavy guns, the Johnston turned to help its fellow destroyer. Its young crew members began to think the unthinkable. And I truly believed that that was the last day of my life. With a Johnston dead in the water, Captain Evans had no option but to abandon ship. It was a, a, a bad feeling. You know. First of all, you know, you'd never seen anything like you, you saw that day, and you was one of those that thought, well, this can't happen to me, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wasn't a good feeling at all. As the survivors huddled together on life rafts, they thought that rescue would come swiftly. As the day wore on and the evening came on and began to get dark, well, then you begin to wonder, now, where in the hell are they? And why aren't they up here, you know, to retrieve us? Within two hours, the Johnston, the Hull, and the escort ship Roberts had been sunk, and the survivors were scattered over miles of ocean. But the U.S. Naval Command was fearful that if one ship should find them and stop, it would be a sitting target for enemy submarines. They issued a terrible order. Permission denied to save survivors. Uh, our task force commander knew exactly where we were. He knew we were in the water. Other ships was asking permission to come back and get us, and it was denied. The men had sacrificed themselves to save the carriers and protect the landings at Leyte Gulf. But for the crew of the destroyers, abandoned in the sea, the horror was far from over. We saw our first shark about three o'clock that afternoon. Somebody would scream out when one of them had a hold of them. And uh, we had a chief petty officer, that one of them got him in one of his thighs, and then just a few minutes afterward, got him in the other thigh. And uh, so th when they'd scream out, you knew 
that a shark was hitting somebody. For the next two days, the men fought the sharks and the elements. The water was cool at night, but the sun was hot in daytime. And uh, of course, we were from here up, you know, we're getting burnt real bad. This little float wasn't very big that we had, and we put the wounded, most wounded, inside that, which was a couple of guys that was burnt real bad and couldn't see. Then dark or just a little bit after dark, both of them died. So we let them slip beneath the surface. When finally rescued, out of the combined crews of over 600, only 147 survived from the Johnston and 86 from the Hull. The heroism of the destroyer crews who had helped to win the Battle of Leyte Gulf was summed up by the official naval historian. In no engagement of its entire history has the United States Navy shown more gallantry, guts, and gumption. Following this victory, the Philippines were successfully recaptured. General MacArthur had fulfilled his promise to return, and a destroyer was there to help fulfill that vow. But for all its armament, the destroyers were small and vulnerable warships, and it was not only from the hands of their enemies that the men of the destroyers faced death. Sometimes, nature would unleash itself with devastating consequences. By late 1944, the Fletcher-class destroyers were now coming off the slipways at an incredible rate of four each month. As soon as they had their shakedown crews, they were hurled into the bloody battle for the Pacific. As American forces slowly recaptured each island, the price in lives kept going up. With the Japanese refusing to surrender, it was a case of kill or be killed. But for the men of the destroyers, death sometimes came from forces which even they could not fight. During the autumn storms of 1944, the USS Spence was part of the escort for Task Force 38. If you was watching the ship, it put it clear out of sight where it would go below the waves, you know, and you think, well, it's gone. Then next time it'd be up above you, 50, 60 feet or more. Sometimes the wind was so strong, if you into the wind, you couldn't breathe. The next day, the weather became even worse. And then the storm became a typhoon. In winds of over 100 miles per hour, huge quantities of water swamped the Spence. I was on the watch on that, and I had all the, all kinds of rain gear on and everything, and the earphones, and you know, it seemed awful funny, like when the ship laid over on its side, and you're walking on the side of it, and then all of a sudden it turns all the way over, and uh, throwed me out in the water then. I didn't dream there'd be a storm enough to sink any ship, any man of war ship, anywhere. At about 11 o'clock in the morning, with winds now reaching over 120 knots, the Spence capsized. Of the 330 men aboard, only 24 survived. Everybody was below deck in the engine room and the fire rooms and that, they, they never had a chance. The chip upside down, there's no way in the world they could ever get out. Two other destroyers also sank in the typhoon, and the mighty carrier, the Hornet, had its flight deck ripped apart. In total, approximately 790 officers and men lost their lives during the storm. But for the men of the destroyers, another far more deadly onslaught was about to face them. By late 1944, during the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Japanese, desperate to defend their positions, turned their fury into a new form of attack, the kamikaze. Again, it was the destroyers that were in the front line of battle. Their mission was clear, target and kill any kamikaze aircraft that came within the vicinity of an aircraft carrier. It was a total suicide effort. Uh, first time I saw it, I couldn't believe it. They came in and we were in a, in a big formation. We had the destroyers in a circle in, in the middle of the big ships. And uh, they had to fly over us to get to the big ships. 
and I would see these planes coming in and see the, the shells going out. And we, we fired the five-inch guns because they had the proximity fuse, which meant they would explode and shrapnel go all over the place. And uh, 40 millimeters are going out, the 20 millimeters are going out when they get close enough. And you just sit there and say, well, you know, God, how can he get through it? There's so much uh, metal up there that they're bound to run into something. But if it didn't hit the right place, then it, it, this thing thinks still flew. So uh, we just grit your teeth and you keep shooting, bang, 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 until <laughs> finally you'd hit it or it would fly over you and go look for something else. But sometimes the kamikaze pilots targeted the destroyers. On April the 6th, 1945, the USS Bush was on picket duty off the coast of Okinawa when CIC's radar picked up a large formation of enemy aircraft. We first spotted them about 50 miles away. We saw a pretty large group, probably 10 to 20 planes. And here's another group behind that. And then almost immediately a third group, and then a fourth group. And so we knew this was going to be a big one. Within a few minutes, the Bush knew that they were the target. We had a plane coming in at low on the water, on our bow, right for us. We fired everything to come loose, the 5-inch, the 40s, the 20s, all were firing, and didn't stop him. A very skilled pilot, and he knew what he was doing, and he hit us exactly right in the spot, the most perfect spot possible, and that is right between the two stacks, right at the waterline. Then about a half hour later, another one came in a little higher and peeled off and came in and hit us on the other side exactly the same way. And then about a half hour later, a third one came in and crashed into the forward, right with the focusal, and that was the most damaging hit in terms of people killed, because we had people out on deck there, and he sprayed gasoline, flaming gas, all over that forward, forward deck. With its hull almost torn in two, the bush sank, taking 87 of its crew with it. In the weeks that followed, the destroyers faced more than 1,500 kamikaze attacks, and by the war's end, had fought in nearly every naval battle. In total, over 1,300 battle stars were awarded to the Fletcher class. But a bigger accolade awaited them. In August 1945, Admiral Bull Holsey ordered that three destroyers, the USS Nicholas, O'Bannon, and Taylor, should accompany the mighty battleship Missouri to accept Japan's surrender because of their valorous fight up the long road from the South Pacific to the very end. We met the Japanese destroyer that came out of Tokyo Bay with the harbor pilots and peace emissaries. And we sent our whaleboat over there and picked them up and then transferred to them to the Missouri and to other ships in the fleet. It was quite an honor. By the end of World War II, 175 of these tough destroyers had been built and sent into battle, but at a price. 25 had been lost. The hulls of steel are long gone, but for the men of the destroyers, the fighting spirit lives on. Thank God for the Fletchers. It was the finest destroyer that was ever built. Be a captain of a destroyer. You're king in your own world.